Um, all right, so our first question is the uh, autonomous lab synapse question. How do we link our local data that we generate in our own labs with global repositories? Is there some way that we could have this in an automated way? Um, does anyone in particular want to, or otherwise I will just pick if no one has a burning desire. Um, I think this actually was piggybacking on um, what Mashid was just saying. So do you want to add a few thoughts there? And then uh, maybe someone else wants to ping in on that particular question as well. Sure. I mean, in our case, um, so obviously we generate a lot of data, but we really don't call them big data because not they are not really big data. But however, for any experimentation that we do, we have a, we provide a, 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 our a data analysis in GitHub through the GitHub link, and our notebook are always provided. Uh, so. Um, that's what we do at the moment. We have uh, we have the collab to, you know, <laughs> uh, to basically share our data. But we don't have a uh, we're not cloud engineers. We are material scientists. Uh, so that is what we are currently doing. Um, Brad, do you want to maybe say something on this, and then we're going to hop to our next question. Sure. I mean, I think this is a pretty hard problem for data, for example, generated at big user facilities um, where it's kind of in a standard format already. I think maybe this is more tractable, but to give you an, an example of one problem we had, um, one of my students told me that it would take 30 hours to restructure her data out of the format of her lab notebook and into the same format as it was published in the paper, basically because we name stuff in our lab notebook using ridiculous naming conventions like after ourselves. And then in the paper, we name it based on some often equally ridiculous, but totally different convention. Um, and interconverting all those things is a massive time suck. So I, I think we need to really be thinking about this from day zero before we even start experimentation, which I think the majority of the community is not. So I, I think there's a, a it's really a cultural shift that's going to have to happen um, to make the data available at a lower cost. Yes, and uh, what you already touched on in your presentation is all about the correct data representation, like a schema, a standardized schema. When you would have this in a global repository for data, then you could, of course, build pipelines that you can actually link your like local from the university or group member the data to. And then within the pipeline, the format gets checked that you are ingesting into the global repository the right data structures. Um, but this is, again, where we come to the question or the, the main issue in our first session today is about like data privacy, who wants to share data, why not, and to give the right incentives to actually do this. And for industry, this is extremely uh, not, not a possibility to them. So that's why then it comes to having structures created that actually allow them to keep their data private, but still have a kind of yeah, federated learning a system where different industry partners can collaborate and can benefit from the uh, higher hierarchy model that gets trained on their individual data, whoever joins this uh, alliance. Um, but yeah, this is, there are ways, I think, but it needs a big impulse. I have, and I, yeah, and I, have... I don't know how publishers will think about that because they lose a little bit of power because now they have the data. If, if, if I may, I'd like to follow up on a thought like that, that, you know, second what Tim was saying, right? I think, you know, this is, this is something that we're wrestling with right now at NIST. Um, you know, we, we, we want to share data, right, to the extent that we can, but sometimes we simply cannot. And, um, you know, kind of going back to the original question, right, which is how can we make make it automated, right? Like, you know, data coming out of your lab, how do you just make it automatically public? I, I know that um, from, from the community that I represent at NIST, um, there are a fair number of people who, you know, who, who would not want that automated, right? They would say, you know, this is raw data, right? There is, there is always the worry that like, I don't, I don't wanna get scooped before I have a chance to publish. But there's also a very legitimate concern, right? Where 
where people say, um, you know, you know, that data, if it were just made public, would be taken out of context. And I wouldn't, I feel like I wouldn't have the um, ability to, to um, you know, put it into the correct context. I worry that it will be misused. So uh, this is complicated. And I think, yeah, I think we, we need further discussions. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to, since you're just talking, I'm just going to piggyback because there's a question very specific for you. Um, so how well are platforms like Nexus Limbs doing in terms of capturing the supporting metadata from other computational experimental sources to create uh, complete data packages with adequate provenance? Provenance, sorry. Okay. There we go. Um, okay, so that was, that was a question Not from cool. Chuck, I'm guessing. Okay. Great. Um, yes. So, <laughs> all right. Yes. Um, That's correct. <laughs> so, so we we are we're not there yet, but we're making progress every day, right? So, for let me give you a for example. Um, we are assembling a um, instrument uh, database so that all of our instruments are going to be are going to be assigned a persistent identifier, right? And with the idea that that instrument is going to be is going to be tracked, right? With eventually, with the publication of the work, you would be able to find out exactly which instrument, at what point in time, if it had a detector upgrade, everything, everything about that instrument, you it will be traceable. We have already uh, have a, a way to link. Um, so when people bring samples into our microscopes, some of our communities are um, have have really great. Um, uh, repository for their samples, right? So in that they, they have a schema that like identifies everything that they ever care about the sample, you know, whether it is, you know, automotive light weighting or additive manufacturing. And what they do is they also produce a persistent identifier, right? Which we then propagate into our research record, right? So we say we have a field that says, give us the persistent identifier if one exists of your samples, right? So through this way, we're also going to be able to link, for example, electronic lab notebooks, right? Or or any or if eventually you might imagine that you're a um, you you conduct simulations, right? And you did you know DFT and you wanted to you know here's the band diagram that accompanies you know this this finding that I'm finding, right? And that there may be a, a persistent identifier for that computational result as well. So I'm envisioning we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there slowly. Um, that eventually we're going to be able to have a whole digital unbroken chain of representation of what all went in from the from the intent right to the result to publication and all of that will be traceable. I hope that answered your question. I think so. Um, kind of following up on that, um, one question is and I'm going to have Tim comment first, if that's okay. How can we support the development of bespoke data management middle layers at the lab level? And how do we make them accessible to less well-resourced labs? The, the second part, maybe, I don't know how you feel about commenting on, you don't have to as much in that and we'll let other people, but you know, how, how do you deal with these um, you know, middle layer bespoke levels of data that you have? before you kind of like go up to more widely sharing them. So this was a question regarding the, uh, the one slide I showed where we built like a small, like infrastructure for our system was it more about like. I'm just asking on a more broader, broader level, like how do you connect things to the more uh, global? Like, like, oh, I guess, um, like, how do you think one should go about connecting? Actually, you can frame it that way instead of what you necessarily do or not do. But how, how do you um, make these connections from the, you know, there, there's kind of like Brad talked about, right? We, ha we have all these these different ways of dealing with our data, right? Sometimes, you know, um, especially, you um, if we're dealing with things that are not necessarily so automated, right? Like there, there's um, like transitioning between how we represent things to our lab notebooks to how we represent things in our publications. Um, and 
sometimes we can get stuck sort of in the middle. Um, so if you want to just more broadly comment on that. Um, okay, so I would, I would slide like this. Uh, when I joined IBM, I didn't know anything about coding. So I just got cross-contaminated, then I started learning myself. <clears throat> and with this experience, I can say most helpful were like um, database and data schema courses that I took to learn how you want to represent or how you have to represent data in an, in an electronic format correctly and compre in a comprehensive way. And then other courses were more about building, let's say, a rather simple infrastructure for your lab and for your project in general. And if you would then, I mean, linking that to a global repository is, uh, I think, a whole nother topic. And we haven't started with that yet. Um, so I don't know if that really answers, answers this question. It's about that, I mean, for me, I think the best way is that chemists in the future have, yeah, significant coding skills to build these infrastructure because we are then just faster than interacting with or hiring actually additional personnel that is only uh, uh, responsible for building the IT infrastructure. So I think um, it helps a lot from my perspective and my experience that you have significant coding skills as a chemist. Yeah, no, that's a, an absolute uh, great point is having the appropriate skill sets. Um, does anyone else want to comment on the skill sets aspect? Um, I, I'll, I'll say a comment. You know, I, I think I agree with Tim that it, we'd like to have a lot more of these skills developed among the chemistry and materials community. But at the same time, I think a lot of researchers enter these communities specifically because they don't want to be computer scientists and they're interested in other branches of science. And, and so I, I don't think we're going to get to a long-term steady state where there's a high level of computer, uh, of fundamental like software engineering and database knowledge among the the practicing scientists, just because they they want to be experts in other things, and and those those expertise have value. So I, I think we do need um, sort of uh, ramps on for people of low skill in 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 computation and data science, and we have to make it accessible to the the person who really has very little expertise. And and I suspect that probably means things that look like commercial or semi-commercial systems, where I can I can basically buy into a data management system the same way I buy into a, a lab notebook or NMR software or, or something like this. That's that's my guess of what's going to be required to project that skill gap. Let me ask a follow-on question because something that affects me a lot. This is these skill sets are very much in demand right now. So do you have any strategies? I mean, you talked about, you know, on-ramping, being able to on-ramp and onboard uh, people with less skill set, but we also need to build production software that's, you know, reliable and robust and that requires, in some sense, some expert people with, with a lot of skill in this, in this field. Any strategies or, you know, good practices you've come across in being able to hire and retain talent in the space? I think we're all suffering from the same thing. <laughs> Not on the panel, but uh, I do think that there, there, there at least is a lot of interest, right? Like I see, um, uh, I, I've run several short courses and I see students wanting to pick up these skills, um, but it's still, you know, I mean, sometimes the people who are the most, uh, love it the most end up, you know, kind of going away from the material side and end up taking alternative career tracks as well. Um, so I don't have an answer, but I at least say like, I mean, uh, there's definitely people who, who are, becoming more interested. And I think that, you know, um, maybe things can be connected with these as autonomous um, moves forward, 
getting more people even more interested. Um, but I've said too much. Um, I'm not supposed to be saying stuff. Um, so I would like to share some of my experience um, because I'm coming from material science department and a lot of the students are not really interested to get more involved in like machine learning or coding and things like that. And the way that we, uh, our approach is, uh, so obviously we are working with our collaborator who uh, developed the code. Um, um, so uh, they are not also computer engineers. They are the domain experts, right? They are also material science, but very expert in developing code and things like that. And interestingly, when, um, you know, uh, for me, at least for my group, it has been, I have been able to encourage them to learn the basics of Python coding and uh, Python coding and using other people's notebook to, um, to basically develop it for our um, workflow and for our data analysis. So for this, they don't need to have a very high skill of programming and coding, but they should be able to read the language and, you know, um, uh, define, change things and uh, those kind of things. Um, so this is this has been our approach. For example, in my case, we do the synthesis, right? We do the photoluminescence, for example, um, a spectroscopy. Uh, however, we use the uh, notebook from our collaborator at Oak Ridge when they use it for, let's say, um, imaging analysis, totally different from luminescence spectra, uh, uh, spectra right? But we, uh, our students use those codes and, and basically um, change it according to our uh, needs and things like that. And that is, so far at least, it has shown that it has been effective and enough for us to be able to analyze data and even use the, you know, those not very complicated machine learning methods, but, um, you know, more basic and simple one for our um, data analysis. Great. Um, yes, so, I think, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I think in academia is way more difficult because when you actually get to students, they are in the process of becoming experts in their scientific fields, right? It was also for me, I didn't learn how to code while I was doing my PhD. It was actually when I was in a company and saw the benefits by, by being exposed to electrical engineers and a lot of computer scientists and also like the whole thought process of yeah, what IBM is as a company, right? So I think what could help for academia would be like, um, like to agree on a syllabus, which are the, the, the core things that need to, that you as professors want your students to learn and to be able to do and then probably organize really condensed uh, summer workshops summer schools whereas um, students your phds actually uh, attend for two months and then they can apply these skills i think that that would be one approach better would be to have it earlier in their studies that they ha already have courses about this Kind of, uh, I mean, you said that you took some classes. So, so how how could you comment on that? Um, like, how did that serve you? Was that effective? Um, is there more efficient ways to do it, especially as we're trying to train up new students? Um, after having taken like a lot of courses, I could definitely point out to the ones that helped me the most and who were most efficient and also now with the experience how I applied the knowledge and how I see most benefits for going from a lab with zero knowledge or zero uh, um, application of lab of the future data infrastructure concepts, <clears throat> then it's more streamlined for me to give probably advices what's most helpful and uh, the fastest way. And yeah, I, I took them on the side and there are a lot of repetitive tasks we have to do as a chemist, like processing data, uh, like taking hundreds of GPCs and processing them and having nice plots in Excel or to generate plots of NMRs for the SIs. So it just takes a lot of time. It's super annoying. So it is like a perfect example uh, to actually use these capabilities. 
these these coding skills very fast to your advantage to just save a lot of time and a lot of annoyance work. Excellent. Um, switching gears a little bit, and one should also check out uh, some of the comments in the, the chat, uh, which hopefully will move over to the document as well for uh, posterity, um, but switching gears a bit. Um, so the question is, and I'll ask several of you, can you comment on, how, on knowing how to structure your data before you've started your research? How do you manage the forward compatibility problem? Basically, you know, th this problem of like, you start your research, you have some idea of how it should be set up, but then you actually start it and you realize that um, maybe that wasn't the best. <laughs> Uh, I think we've all been there at some point. Um, anyone particularly want to take this? Otherwise, I'm going to pick Brad. You're up. I mean, I, I think that several folks have mentioned the the idea of having a schema. I think if you have a schema for your data before you start the research, this helps an awful lot to resolve a, a large fraction of the the issues that you'll encounter. Because then at least as you're as you're making things, even if you're turning directions, making new samples, you you are entering and recording everything consistent with how you know you're going to try to report it in the end. Um, so I, I think that's really important. Um, we've also encountered a lot of issues around basically naming conventions for samples, which certainly takes a U-turn as the experiment um, takes a U-turn. And yeah, I'm not sure, especially since I know during writing things up, we change the naming convention in the paper a lot of times because people don't like it and they want to represent a different way. So I, I think there may be, um, there may not be a universal solution, but there may be sort of best practices like names that have clean structures such that they can be mapped one onto another. So if we change, for example, the naming convention, we can use automated mappings and find and replace to sort of quickly rewrite the whole thing rather than having to manually go through. Um, probably things like that help, even if we can't anticipate all the problems. Jim, you want to talk about this from maybe the user facility perspective? Yeah, I can. I can share with you what we've done. Um, so when we built Nexus Limbs, which is which is um, if you if you were one of our users and you logged into Nexus Limbs, what you would do is you would be able to do quickly search through some things and uh, it would display things that you care about, like who did the experiment, you know, what sample was I looking at. So it was like a web interface and it renders things like microscopy images and spectroscopy data, right? And when we built Nexus Limbs, what we did was, you know, we said, we're not gonna make users fill out this form with a hundred fields in it. We're not gonna make you tell us what was your excitation of your objective lens and condenser C1, C2, C3, and all of those other 10 lenses on your column, right? Not gonna do that. So what we did was we basically just stole the metadata right off the file. It's already in your file header, right? If you, I actually did this exercise. If you print that file header out, it's 44 pages on an eight point font. There's a lot in there. So we also quickly realized we're not gonna display all of that for the users because then their head would spin. What we did as managers of the facility was we took that 44 pages of eight point font and we took a yellow highlighter and we said, we think based on past usage, that people would really care to search on these terms. So we took a highlighter and we searched and we, we, we highlighted everything. So these are the things that get displayed today on Nexus Limbs. However, that is fully configurable. You could take that software, go to a different facility and that facility manager would, might say, you know what, we really don't care about what these guys want. This is what we want. We Of these 44 pages, we want only those three things or maybe we want 23 pages of those things, right? And so you can design a web representation of all of the data that you already have, right? And display it to your users, or you could do it for yourself if you're really savvy, right? And in this way, you kind of have a little bit of both worlds, right? You could keep everything that is natively available to you. And you could also make a tool that is, that is you know, that can make, you know, reviewing and discovering data just a little bit less painful for your people. Excellent. 
Um, so uh, I'm gonna, there's a kind of a follow-up question, um, which I'm gonna have um, uh, Meshin have you speak. Um, so having a schema before starting the research helps, but um, sometimes this requires community work because the way to develop a schema is to understand, you know, the queries that you're having. This kind of goes to some of the things that that June talked about, but we'd like your perspective as well. Uh, sorry, once, once, uh, one more time. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, okay, so uh, like having a schema is very useful. Um, how do you see the role of a community? in developing schemas versus like individual labs, like how to make that interconnect. Individual labs. Yeah, versus like, you know, if you're gonna have a, a schema that you can use beyond just your labs, you really need community input as well. And so how, how do you make the, like, how do you get community? Like, do you think you need community in, input or do you it's think- actually it's difficult because right. in my opinion it's difficult because you know every lab has their own uh i, I don't know they're, they're they're working on different different uh, materials different workflow uh different characterization um i don't know maybe that could be a little bit difficult um uh, i don't know how to answer that this is um I mean, as I mentioned, um, even even the feedback that I get through my experiment and I need to uh, change my workflow dynamically based on the feedback that I get, it could be different from uh, the next lab, right? Uh, so um, I don't know how it works in terms of, you know, um, uh, synthesis compared to synthesis compared to like other um, other fields, right? Um, I don't know if any of you have any other opinion <laughs> I would like to hear, but that's my idea. <laughs> it's difficult to say at this point, at least. Maybe Brad and team that they're also working on synthesis, they can have some idea. <laughs> so I'm going to maybe switch gears a tiny bit. Um, uh, so um, Tim, what are the limits of our current a data infrastructure in the context of trying to build, a, you know, these labs of the future, which I think are primarily a, autonomous. Um, so, so what what's holding us back in terms of the data infrastructure? Um, from like a very current like project, or from my current project, I can say that having characters, um, characterization tools, like the instruments we are using more or less every day, um having them equipped with the right let's say interfaces to actually uh, remotely operate them this is a main thing for us right now because you have partly they're old partly they might be new but the software is not i mean let's say the um the manufacturers didn't think that far yet to equip them with like a basic api that you can at least submit an experiment because you can manually load. Maybe some labs already have uh, robots that load the um, <clears throat> the auto sampler rack with the samples. But then you would like to also, by code, execute the experiments. Maybe you even define them, or you have a standard procedure. You would actually only need to input the names and and hit run. But this is not possible with the machine that we are currently working on. And it's little. It's a big headache. It's a big block of for the progress of the. Uh, the project and i think manufacturers need to understand that that everything is moving this way and that they can actually benefit by teaming up with academic groups or other industry partners like us because we could co-develop that already and test it 
So yeah, this is um, infrastructure is like it's a big topic because infrastructure also means hardware and everything. So I'm not into like hardware and like uh, I I know how to use the resources, but lab infra data infrastructure is like a big topic where it comes like with with servers, file servers, setting up locally or actually using like cloud capabilities. Where I think it's more convenient for smaller groups because they don't need to have all the hardware on premise. But interfaces in general, with whatever tool you're working or want to work, like HDE tools, if they don't come with the interfaces to remotely operate them, it makes it creates bottlenecks or even like hinders projects from moving forward. Unless you have very experienced software engineers who might want to crack the software to say it this way. Anyone else want to comment on that one? Other major limitations other than interfacing? I had a related question, maybe from several um, of the speakers. We saw synthesis and characterization were both part of the same workflow and facility. Um, how far? Can that be pushed? Um, so I work at you know the APS, and you know synthesis is usually very distinct from the characterization that we do here. Although we do have a few um, tools where you could do things like watch um, growth processes um, in C2 and so on. So given the sort of if this is a restriction and it looks like maybe it is, how far could you go in a single lab setting where the whole loop is complete? Have a question for. Brad and Tim and Mar and Marshid as well. Yeah, I would say I think there's some demonstrations of doing uh, you know really complete loops. So uh, Argon National Lab has been, you know, of course pushing uh, their their autonomous lab cycle all the way from synthesis to characterization and, and has made a bunch of public disclosures about this. And I think there's some cool stuff of carts driving samples around and and things like that. Um, so I, I think there's the like what's possible and, and that's probably going to be somewhere close to total integration. And I think there's the what makes sense on a day to day research basis, um, because the cost of integration and full automation goes up very high for for certain bits. And I think those bits won't make sense for the majority of discoveries or the majority of researchers. You know, having a technician in the loop that carries a rack from A to B may make more sense than building a lot of tracks for certain types of connections. And, and so I think, I think you're gonna see that there's gonna be a spectrum based on sort of cost, difficulty of, of automating the task, based on how flexible you want it to be. My experience is that you know, the less flexible you want to be, the more you can automate it, but then your system becomes hard to change in the future. And people in the loop are pretty adaptable still relative to the robotics. So I, I think there's going to be a lot of trade-offs and, and a spectrum of, of possible answers. Yeah, I second Brad. And I, as I mentioned, in my opinion, and many of my colleagues, uh, the labs of the future cannot be fully automated. It's the mix of human and, and uh, uh, robot because, you know, uh, having robot is even more expensive, right? They also, they cannot dynamically uh, change decision, get the feedback and, you know, work uh, based on that. Uh, I mean, I know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, discussion about this um, feedback loop that you constantly provide provide the feedback to your automated experimentation and you change. But I, I at least based on my experiment, uh, experience, that is not uh, very well developed. It will take a lot long time and I'm not sure even if 100% doable. <laughs> at least in terms of, uh, you know, chemistry and synthesis and uh, things like that. Makes sense, thank you. So um, when we're talking about labs of the future, I mean, even myself, who's a computational person, I tend to, to think a lot about experiments, right? Labs of the future. Um, uh, in grad school, we joked that our lab was either imaginary or in case based, depending on how we felt on a particular day. Um, uh, so 
how do you foresee, um, I mean, some of the data science aspects and how they integrate are, are a bit more obvious, but how does computational play a role in integrating with the lab of the future as well? And you can comment either on the computational side or also on, you know, continuing to connect um, with data science, maybe beyond just doing active learning in a traditional autonomous type of way? Like what if you wanna like zoom out and think about connecting your data with other people's data as well? Um, does anyone have some thoughts on that? Tim, you wanna go or? I don't know, Marcia, you can go first. I saw you. <laughs> oh, no, no. I mean, sorry, go ahead. No, no, yeah, I have one, one classical way of thinking uh, is the co -navig they call it co-navigation or this cycle between the, the theory and experiment. When, when, you know, theory initially, let's say about the materials that I'm working on, there's, uh, you know, really an infinite number of organic molecules that you can use in the uh, in the perovskite structure and make this uh, make this uh, 2d um, you know hybrid perovskite right so the the theory can obviously calculate or uh, provide information on what kind of organic molecules can uh, provide a better transport properties when it combined with the uh, with the perovskite structure for let's say solar cell right so you get this information um, then you synthesize the materials and do the characterization and provide the feedback to the theory how to improve or how to develop how to make new molecules that can um, you know uh, can provide the uh, 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 the required transport properties that you need for the solar cell and, you know, optimize the materials based on that. Uh, that That is a classical way of thinking of that. Uh, I don't know, there could be some other way of connecting DFT to theory to, to experimentation. Other thoughts? I mean, I think in general, we can all agree that DFT and calculations and more uh, quantum simulations are a great tool uh, for enrich your data to maybe come up with like more comprehensive machine learning models that you can build by having just broader data from other, from, from other sources as well. Properties that you couldn't measure in your lab or fast enough as well. Okay, um, let's see if I'm missing things. Um, So, um, June, you already talked a little bit about this, um, but uh, kind of stepping out like on a broader level, um, how do we incentivize the labs of the future? Like to, to, to make this happen? Um, yeah, so so the the incent so I want to say from the get go that the incentive for government is different than the incentive for a private company and is different for academia, right? Clearly. So I I'm only qualified to talk about my perspective as a government employee. Um, I think that um, so we share some concerns, right? Um, some of our colleagues here at NIST has already done this, right? Where say, for example, we have a neutron source and their data, 
data sets are given a DOI and published immediately, um, unless there is an embargo agreement in place. And so what that means is, yeah, if anybody cites your data set, that's a citation because it has a DOI. Right. We have with the electron microscopy community, we have yet to do this. Um, that's an ongoing discussion. So I think certainly, you know, the the am I going to be given proper attribution? Right. Solving that is is really important. Nobody wants to get scooped. Right. So, you know, what is the right length of embargo? Um, you know, I think that I, I caught a, a not not totally related, but I think it is related to this conversation, right? In the sidebar here, somebody had wrote, you know, like for a little lab from a little university or whatever, right? How am I going to ever have the resources to develop all of this infrastructure? And you know, that's that's really hard. Uh, and I'm not I'm not I don't I don't have a clear answer for that. But I will say that maybe part of the job of this community, right, is to figure out what things are considered key infrastructure, right, for a research institution. So that some of that cost maybe is, will be borne by your institution and not by your lab, that doesn't have to come out of your research fund, right? One of the areas that we identify, for example, is persistent identifiers, right? I think every institution ought to have a way to generate and mint you know, persistent IDs, because I, I do think that if we, uh, you know, are really serious about some of the topics that we've talked about here, there is no other way around it. Um, we're certainly not going to go and fight over a, a fight over naming convention of your samples, right, for example. So, so I think we, if we identify those things, right, which will, which will be like the, the tide that raises all boats, right, then, then we can make a case that, hey, you know, maybe research institutions really should be funding these things that now we're identifying as basic baseline research infrastructure. That would be my take. Okay, I, I do want to hear the other perspectives as well, but there's a specific sub question in uh, the, you've been talking a lot about DOIs in particular, so I'm asking you, um, and it specifically builds on what you have. Um, so those of us who mint DOIs can be frustrated by the lack of scientifically relevant metadata. Do we need a science DOI or can we work with data site to make optional but formal extensions to the data site schema? Or is that too rough? <laughs> I, I'm going to see if other people have something more intelligent to say on this one before I say anything. OK, well, then maybe we'll hop back to the incentivizing progress, because I think that really goes back to the heart of you know forming working groups in, in the topic today. Um, and I do want to hear from everyone, because I feel like you all have a slightly different perspective that's very valuable. Um, uh, Brad, do you want to go next? I mean, I, I think the idea of, of the small groups and the barriers versus incentives is, is a really good one. I think um, to me, what's really attractive is, is sort of consortium style models where um, many people can contribute and, and build out a final product. I know there were some things in the chat about software development being a collaborative enterprise. And, and so I think getting you know, large teams that that work well together. And, and certainly you had mentioned about working groups, Debbie, that can be a great focal point for building those teams. I think that's a way to uh, let people use a lot of whatever everyone else has built. Because the great thing about digital infrastructure is we don't actually all need our own, right? Digital stuff can be copied pretty cheaply. Um, so whereas we all need our own instrument, you know, the, we could share a digital infrastructure. I think that gives a good incentive for adoption, right? If you don't have to build it yourself entirely. Um, sorry, uh, Mashid, do you want to go? Incentive. I just second Brad. <laughs> I <Okay>. agree with him. <laughs> and Tim? Specifically, it'd be interesting to hear from, you know, an industry perspective, 
like even just internally, right? Like how, how does there even need to be incentives within IBM? I hear lots of really awesome stuff coming out of IBM in terms of lab of the future. Um, yeah, but I mean, as you said, we are, well, IBM is industry and as industry, your incentive is making money. So you need to come up with these tools, right? Um, for academia, it's a little difficult. I, I think it's a different perspective. I mean, you want to push your, your research. And, and as, as Brad said, nobody needs to build everything on its own and like copy paste, like main infrastructure parts, like locally all the time. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I guess I kind of was just uh, wondering, like, you know, sometimes, right, in, in academia, we, we um, try to do things to show that they can be done, right? Um, but not necessarily, like, we, we hope that they're part of, like, some bigger thing, that they're going to be used, that they will eventually will have some sort of new material or, or optimization or whatnot, but we, we're not necessarily working at that end. Um, and, uh, you know, I, but I've definitely heard of cases where people have tried to automate things, but to be honest, the amount of time that they spent automating it would have been so much longer than if they just you know, when in the lab and they did it. And and when, I guess I'm wondering how that shakes out from an industrial perspective, because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you said it comes down to money, right? And and so um, I guess, is there an understanding that, that this, you know, you're essentially putting in a, a additional capital up front, both capital in terms of money and capital in terms of you know, time and resources that eventually will pay off or, or how does that balance work out, I guess? Does that make sense? You can say no. I, I, I think I, I think I got some some parts of um, the aspects. So it's, it's all about what makes sense to automate, what we already touched on. And when you come, when you can be faster doing it like, by hand okay and it, the uh, process might change again so it's not an everyday process that you can that you can be sure about this will happen like the next five years it's a project for the next three months yeah automating is probably not uh, uh not the way how to spend your time wisely on that and your resources as well but if there's something that i mean in industry when you have very um defined tasks like developing a drug and you always, you know, you have to use CC coupling reactions and you develop a system that can automate specific A plus B plus catalyst um, and conditions like steps within the whole process to do these couplings, then it makes sense to have a system that completely works autonomous on optimizing individual CC coupling steps. But if it if the process becomes way more complex, like uh, what Mashid is working on, for example, then it's, Unless it's it's really like okay, you're doing this the next ten years, like thinking as a company. This is we have the funding. This is uh, what our company's purpose will be and our goal will be. And then thinking like long term. But I think in academia, academia projects change faster, and you have to be more adaptive. And you want to actually like go to the um, yeah, you want to be more flexible as well. But if there are processes that you know you will always use in your facility, maybe sharing it with other departments, that might be more valuable to, to think about that, like not only for your group, but with other departments as well. Excellent. I, I want to add a comment, actually. I just thought mm -hmm. of this, um, you know, while we're on the incentivizing um, thought, um, you know, I think that, and, and this is maybe a message for funding agencies, right? I, I don't know. We don't we don't really take any funding from funding agencies, but um, but I, what I see, right, is that um, you know, for 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 funding agencies and 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 the academic colleagues, right, the reward is publication, right, and more publication, and the more you publish, like the more you're rewarded, right? Um, and 
as long as that is your incentive structure, that isn't going to what what that incentivizes is whatever it takes to get me like the best publication quickest. And it doesn't it doesn't pay for you to like work on a problem that is long haul. You can't, you won't survive. So I, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is, right? But maybe maybe there could be a different funding program, right? For people to work on like these kind of long haul projects that aren't gonna be, you know, that are that aren't a traditional payout mechanism, right? In terms of like H index and 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 like you know, you publishing in science and nature. Excellent. Yeah, and especially what you just touched on the uh, the award for the scientists, the, the new material, the new process, the, the, the new uh, science scientific accomplishment that comes out of it. But building the whole infrastructure, you probably don't have anything really to publish during the whole time. I will second that. <laughs>